we're going to be I'm going to be talking to Dan Walter of Ember Energy about the dominant energy narratives today. And this is uh, something in, that uh, is important in Canada. Energy media has been involved in this debate. And I really like the way that Ember has framed the issue. So welcome to the interview, Dan. Thank you for having oh, me, Mark. Hang on a second. That's that is incorrect. I just finished saying I wasn't going to do that. And then I, I go ahead and do it. So let's try this again. Now, Dan, the uh, incumbent energy narrative is fossils versus climate. We've run into this in Canada. We've uh, we've had some, you know, there are energy training courses that use this exact framing, and it seems it seems dominant throughout both industry and government across the country. And I would argue now in the U.S. with uh, Donald Trump and energy dominance, it's also dominant there. Uh, maybe give us a, an overview of the debate. Yes, yeah, so there are basically two camps in the energy transition right now, dominant in this in the energy debate that we hear every day. On the one hand, there is this sort of incumbent energy view by it's a fossil gradualist view that looks at the energy system as it is today and kind of sees it in a way as perfect. Fossil fuels is the pinnacle of human invention very hard for humanity ever to improve upon. And therefore, things like renewables or electric vehicles or new energy technology that comes in as an additional thing that comes maybe on top, maybe for those countries that are very rich that can afford sort of the frivolity of electro tech. Then on the other hand, we have a much more technocratic view on the climate side. And that looks at the energy sector uh, far from something perfect, but rather as a problem to be solved something that is actually actively destroying our planet because of the carbon emissions and the imperative of fixing climate change. And so this is a this is a side that comes much more from the perspective of governments need to take the lead, set plans, and companies and incumbents just need to sort of repent and follow the government plan towards this uh, net zero society. Now, both of those views are kind of polarizing in this debate. Why we think we need a third view, a new view, why this is stuck is because neither really has a good explanatory power of what is happening in the world today. And, and let me name two or three facts here uh, just, just to highlight how neither camp really has much to say or much explanatory power about the world today. Think, for instance, about the Pakistan solar boom. Pakistan is rapidly building solar, very rapidly importing solar from China and deploying it on the ground. It's a renewable boom country. It's not particularly rich. So it's not that they're, you know, suddenly got very rich and they are suddenly, you know, want to build renewables just for fun. So the fossil side of the argument doesn't really hold. Neither do they have particularly strong climate plans or are pushing very hard on carbon emissions. So the climate use is clearly not quite right. There's clearly something else going on here. And this goes beyond just a couple of countries where we can talk about electric vehicle uptake in countries like Nepal or Ethiopia, where we see a uptake above 60% of sales being electric vehicles. This goes to Latin America, rapidly seeing a rise in solar deployment and wind deployment. Africa, as we uh, at Ember wrote about this summer, so seeing a solar boom all across the continent, rapid imports of solar panels. And so we're seeing things happening now in the world, new facts are, uh, that are coming in that just don't fit in either view. And that's why we argue we need a new view of energy to actually explain the world as we see it happening today. Here at Energy Media, we have a, an energy transition theory of change. And it's based on the idea that electrotech, which we'll, in a subsequent interview, will define in more detail, but electrotech, broadly speaking, is wind and solar and batteries and EVs and heat pumps and electrical uh, industrial processes and so on. And that electrotech has followed a traditional uh, S-curve pattern of development and, and adoption. And electrotech has been on the bottom of the S-curve for 50 years. This, 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 nobody flipped, flipped the switch in 2020, and suddenly this uh, technology appeared. It's been getting better and better. But all of those technologies, or most of them, um, when 2020 came along, that's kind of the inflection point for them. When they were not competitive with oil and gas and coal, now they are competitive. And you're starting to see your colleague, uh, Kingsmill Bond, has said many times in my interviews, first, the new technology takes the growth. 
And once that's done, then it begins to eat into the existing demand. And already we're seeing things like solar taking almost all of the growth, like 89% of electricity uh, demand growth last year was supplied by solar. This year, it's more than 100% in China. And so I think the way to frame this is technologies that were slowly, slowly getting better and better around 2020 became competitive and now are zooming up the hockey stick part of the, the curve. And that's why the these other two narratives kind of got caught. You know, they, they haven't updated this so to include this new reality. Now, that's my take on it. Would you agree? It seems to be kind of consistent. Entirely right, Markham. Um, this is a great convergence of technologies that generations of very clever humans have been developing, going back, uh, back as far as like, I don't know, 1900 or before, right? When you think about the development of electric motors and pumps and these kind of things, things have just gradually become better and better. And they are now converging after a century of evolution into this decade of revolution. And, and it's, it's good to have a, a, to step back sometimes and realize how miraculous it is, this convergence. We're talking about wind and solar, battery powered cars, and heat pumps in cold climates particularly, becoming competitive all within the last couple of years. After decades of development, it's almost miraculous that when you see these cost decline curves, that these tipping points are all happening right now over the past five years. So this has been coming for decades and decades. This has been coming since World War II. And somehow we are lucky enough that we live in this explosive moment in the 2020s when all these technologies are almost at the same time becoming competitive. And this is why we don't talk about this as a tra technology transition, as we've seen many times in history. But these are all these technology transitions right, from fossil generation to solar power, from uh, ICE cars to EV cars, from gas boilers to heat pumps. They're all happening at the same time. And that really makes us say this is not just a transition of technologies. This is a revolution uh, of the energy system. I'd like, I talked about the S curve a, a little bit uh, earlier, and I want to introduce another little bit of theory, which is A.E. Rogers' bell curve. You know, the on the left side of the bell curve, you've got innovators and early adopters and early, you know, most people are from vague, at least vaguely familiar with that terminology. And I would argue that because the convergence that you just described really only kicked off five years ago, that the idea of an energy revolution is still well over on the left side of the bell curve. It's the innovators and early adopters like Energy Media and, and Ember Energy that have got it and developed it and, and are promoting it as a, a, a frame, a narrative to understand uh, the changes in the energy system. But we're starting to see the, that narr new narrative inch its way up the bell curve. More and more and more people all the time, especially outside of North America, are adopting this view of the energy system. And that really, you know, we're almost starting to get to exponential growth, where this idea is gaining traction and being accepted. Yes. And I think one of the interesting things that we're seeing, I think, happening in the world is that uh, the, those early movers, or, or rather the early movers moving into the mainstream, uh, might not per se be something that is happening in the West. And we're seeing actually a lot of people starting to realize this in emerging markets. They're starting to realize, hang on, we get two people knocking on our doors. We get people that want to sell us LNG and one of people that sell us solar power. Who do we actually opt for? They're not looking at this through the lens of identity politics or through the lens of carbon emissions. They're just looking at it through the lens of purely power politics and, and geopolitical independence and they pick solar and that's what we're seeing happening across the world and so it is interesting when we when we designed that s curve or that, that bell curve and if we would have designed that if maybe you and i would have designed that 10 years ago we would have said maybe you know we have some tr some front runner co countries in europe and some front runner states in the us um, and then you get a whole wave of you know, other US states, other European countries, and probably all the way at the end, maybe we sit, sit at countries like India and China that will have a much tougher time to actually both grow and adopt this new, more expensive technology. 
But what's happened now is kind of it's the world upside down. It's it's flipped around and it's actually the emerging markets are getting this much more uh, at the moment, I would say, than many countries in the West. And I think that's a big surprise of how this bell curve is actually organized uh, is very different, I think, than most of us thought even five or 10 years ago. Um, and that also is a reason for optimism, because it's actually the regions we thought were going to be hardest, where we now actually see most of the drive to go faster comes from. Yes. And uh, I would also argue um, that, you know, this has been driven by China. China has done the innovation. It's scaled up manufacturing. It's scaled up deployment. And there's emerged a China model where you, you know, this is not driven by emissions. It's not driven by, by oil or gas. It's driven by electricity. So they're, they, they're expanding their power sector. Uh, there's more high efficiency coal, there's more uh, solar, there's more wind, they're building hydro, they're building nuclear. And the end game is to build a power sector that can run 100% on renewables, but uses high efficiency coal as a backup. They even have a capacity market to, to fund that. And then what they do is they're now busy electrifying the demand side of the, of the equation. And so uh, I think that countries like India and Malaysia and Indonesia are looking at that model and saying, that's the future. And we don't want to lock ourselves into uh, LNG for 25 years. We don't want to lock ourselves into oil imports for another 25 years. We now have the ability to generate electricity domestically, buy the technology once, generate the electricity, and to use these demand side uh, technologies to turn that energy into work. And that gets us out of the fossil fuel uh, business, except maybe you know coal for a while uh, to generate the, the power that rapid expansion requires. Uh, your, your take on that. Yeah, I very much... I, I... I agree. Maybe maybe on this uh, point of China driving this transition, I think there is another a bit of a misconception uh, right now on who actually big oil is fighting here in this transition. Because the, the general conception that we have in the West is this is big oil versus small entrants. And, and so it's a very tough and unfair competition because how do the small entrants even know how to build a big company, let alone build a big company with new technology, etc.? But this actually, if you look into the origin story of electrotech in China, you see that many of the companies from BYD to CATL to uh, what have, Xpeng, what have you, they all come from people that started their careers in digital tech. They made the hardware revolution that made the laptops that we're currently on and the internet we're currently on. They made the hardware where we in the West only saw the software of the IT revolution, really. They made all the kit that made all of this possible. These are the people that are running these electrotech companies. When you look at the places where electrotech is made, the 60% of solar panels are made in three provinces in China, which also happen to be the three main provinces where Apple has invested in high-tech manufacturing skills of the local population. By some estimates, tens of millions of people were trained in the Apple way of high-tech production across these provinces in China. This is a tremendous amount of time and effort that the tech industry has put into China to build up high-tech manufacturing cap capabilities. And now people in China are taking those capabilities and going from tech into energy. And so really what I'm starting to feel, and, and we're, we're, kind of, we're, we're just about grasping this story at the moment, is that it is wrong to think that this is big oil versus small entrance. This is a titan battle between big oil and big tech. The people that are used to disrupting trillion dollar industries, they are now coming to energy. And so once we conceptualize that this is more Exxon versus Apple than it is Exxon versus a guy in the basement with, with a new startup, the better we can understand why China has been so incredibly fast and powerful in rolling this out. This is an engine that can disrupt very quickly. And that's exactly what we're seeing uh, unfolding right now. Yes, and that's a very, uh, that's a very important point for understanding the energy narrative that we're talking about here and why it's important to go from the, you know, the fossil gradualist view and, and to not be trapped into the climate view, but to take this third view, 
which sees uh, the world, the energy system, the energy world in a very different light. And I think much better reflects the evidence on the ground. Exactly. And, and it, as often as uh, one of my uh, old mentor, Emery Lovins at uh, RMI, always puts forward uh, in his introduction presentations, sometimes you only solve the problem by making it larger. And that's, I think, what, what, what we're also trying to do is with Electrotech is saying, like, let's not just focus on energy. Let's take a step further away and say, let's look at this in the wider economic context. Why is it possible that China can drive now as much as I think it was like 10 or 5 percent of GDP or it's 10 percent of growth, 5 percent of total GDP from Electrotech? How is it possible that electric vehicles have just become so much better, so much faster and the large uh, diesel and gasoline manufacturing countries in the world? are actually now on decline compared to China. How is all of this possible? Only when you zoom out a little bit, do you see the larger picture that all of this plays in. And again, that's a, another limitation of the old two views, both the fossil view and the climate view. They look at energy almost in isolation as its own entity and problem to be fixed or, or entity to be profited on. Once you zoom out, you see all the other innovations around uh, uh, that are happening around energy. It becomes much more clear why the why Electrotech is going so fast, and that includes, by the way, the rise of AI. That includes the rise of smartphones and, and laptops that made batteries cheaper. This is all part of the same ecosystem that Electrotech sits in. It's just that the energy people, like you and I, and, and many other people that will uh, listen to this podcast, they're used to focusing on the energy side of things. But the story here is much larger. Dan, fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for this. Thank you.